So one of the great pleasures of serving as the uh, director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Health and Society, which a term I just started this year, has been joining a community of scholars and students and teachers who are asking the most pressing questions about health, well-being, and justice, and doing so with great incisiveness and creativity. Cassandra Harpley's work is emblematic of that determination and creativity. In her teaching, performance, ethnography, and writing, Professor Hartblay asks pointed questions. She asks students and audiences to consider perhaps unsettling insights, and she does so with a profound sense of fairness and empathy for the lives that she studies, the people she represents, and the minds she transforms. It's a pleasure to work alongside such a thinker. Dr. Hartblay is Assistant Professor of Anthropology and Health Humanities at the University of Toronto Scarborough. She's a member of the graduate faculty in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto and an affiliate faculty member at the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Dr. Hartley received her PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has held postdoctoral appointments at Yale University and with the University of California Collaboratory for Ethnographic Design. Dr. Harpley received the Irving K. Zola Award for Emerging Scholars in Disability Studies in 2013. She's worked as an applied qualitative researcher with the Soros Foundation, contributing to a collected volume on the inclusive, excuse me, on inclusive education in Central Asia, as a studio coordinator at Interact Center and Arts and Theater Center for Adults with Disabilities in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and as an arts manager organizing cultural exchange programs for dancers writers and filmmakers between the United States and Russia. Professor Harpley's talk today, Disabled People Are the Experts, Lessons from Disability Studies, interrogates the typical definition of disability as a chronic condition that significant, significantly impacts the daily life of an individual and the argument that having a disability often means living a more difficult life, not only due to one's bodily impairment, but also because of the social wor world being configured for non-disabled people. She builds her analysis on insights from the activist-led interdisciplinary field of disability studies using examples from popular culture and from her ethnographic research with adults with mobility and speech impairments in Northwestern Russia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Harpley. Um, thank you uh, for that really lovely introduction. And it's just such a pleasure to get to work with you, uh, Jessica. And we're also lucky to have um, Jessica here as the new director of Health Humanities uh, or Health Studies and the Interdisciplinary Center for Health and Society at UTSC. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, it's so nice to see you all. And I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to end this series and reflect on the wonderful scholars who have already contributed to this discussion uh, over the past month. Um, so I thought that today one of the things that I would do would knit, be to knit together some of the themes that have come up in the previous talks. I see many faces who have been here throughout the month. Um, and if you're listening to these talks remotely or if you missed other parts of the series, um, the series is recorded. And I encourage you to go back and find the other talks by David Onley, uh, Sean Lee, and Anne McGuire online. So today, I'll address my own research on disability in contemporary Russia. And that brings up some questions about what do we do with the realization that our ideas about disability and ableism are not the same as those in other cultures. And I'll also talk about how ethnography is particularly suited to document and analyze this kind of cultural difference, and in particular, the different kinds of disability expertise that arise uh, in different cultures. And I'll talk about what I mean by disability expertise. Um, so finally, what I really want to get to then is why disabled people historically have not been seen as experts in their own lives and how research and scholarship can help us to get to this way of thinking about the kinds of expertise that people with disabilities might hold. Uh, before I go any further, I just want to emphasize that as part of the aesthetic of disability uh, studies, uh, we like to think about accessibility as part of everything that we do. And so with that in mind, uh, I'll invite all of you to move about as you need, get up and leave the room if you need to do so. 
Uh, if you can't hear me or if there's a problem with the sound, please raise your hand. I'll be happy to stop and accommodate and make any changes that I can to facilitate that. And finally, as one access practice that is particularly, um, there's a funny feedback, um, that's particularly common in disability studies circles, I want to acknowledge that we can't always see the slides that are on the screen. So one thing I'm going to be doing that you'll notice is I'll be just mentioning what's on each slide. Um, and that's an access practice that might seem a little funny at first, but it also is sort of part of pointing out the thing I want to say, say about what's on the slide. And it just recognizes that we can't always all see everything at the same time or in the same way. So um, let's get going. Right, so in terms of how the talk today will go, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is disability studies as an interdisciplinary field. And then again about this global approach to disability studies that I take. I'll situate that in terms of my own story and my ethnographic research methods. I'll give you some stories from my research that illustrate this idea of disability expertise. And then I'll con conclude with a few thoughts about this year's Great Exploration Seminar and the future of disability studies at UTSC. So what is disability studies? Certainly, we can all recognize that around the world, people with disabilities are systematically dispossessed, incarcerated in institutions, injured, impoverished, disenfranchised, denied legal voice, abused, neglected, or simply excluded from leadership in social circles. And disability studies is an interdisciplinary field of study that across several waves of scholarship over the past 30 years has come to be defined by a commitment to pursuing more just futures for people with disabilities, foregrounding the point of view of people with disabilities themselves, and contributing to building an interdisciplinary canon of research and work around disability studies. And in particular, this is an activist interdisciplinary field that's built on the history of the disability rights movement, including civil rights. If you were here for David Onley's talk, uh, you can hear, you remember some of his discussion of disability advocacy here in the Toronto community. On the screen now is a photo of a well-known disability rights activist uh, in Berkeley, California with a sign, Civil Rights for the Disabled. And some of the major ideas that emerge from the disability rights movement is the idea of nothing about us without us. That very often people with disabilities are seen as dependent and in need of other people to help them or make decisions for them. And disability activists say, make sure we're in the room. Make sure we're saying what our own needs are. Nothing about us without us. And in particular, that movement came largely out of a desire to live, study, and work in the community, which led to an adv advocacy for deinstitutionalization, or the movement of people with disabilities out of separated living spaces and back into the community. And this is a struggle that, of course, continues today. On the screen now is a photo of a really lovely disability studies activist and author and scholar named Simi Linton, who lives in New York City. She's the author of a landmark 1995 book titled Claiming Disability, in which she argues that actually saying that you're a person with a disability is a radical act, because for so long we've lived in a world where disability is seen as something undesirable. So in 2005, uh, Linton wrote a paper for a conference in which she recalled the activists and scholars in the 1980s and 90s that came together to observe representations of people with disabilities in literature and film. And artistic expression were so rare, or they tended to represent disability in a flat or uninspired way. And of course, those of you who are here for Sean Lee's talk saw some of the amazing work that's come out of a movement to create exciting disability arts today. Um, but at that time, Simi Linton and others were calling for better inclusion and legal protection for people with disabilities. And as she recalled the way that this led to the invention of disability studies as a field, Linton wrote that, Quote, we have enlisted people from a broad range of disciplines in redefining the quote unquote problem of disability. But what is the problem? Where is it located? Who can fix it? What scholarship is needed 
to prepare people to fix the problem. And then she offers another way of describing disability studies. And you can see in the image, she's raising two hands, the right hand in a fist and the left hand flat open in front of her. She says, I am raising both of my hands in front of me, the right curled in a fist, the left open and ready to receive the fist. Let us imagine that the fist, and you can all do this with me if you like, let's put up a fist and a hand. So if we imagine the fist as disabled people and the left hand as society, everyone might agree, at least publicly, that there should be a good fit, that disabled people should fit into society. And what distinguishes disability studies from other approaches to disability is the way that we conceptualize this for, poor fit that generally exists. Our explanation of what causes the poor fit and our prescription for change is to make a better fit. We need to change the hand or society rather than the disabled person. So rather than try to change a person or an individual to better fit into society, we're asking the hand or society to change to be more accommodating of the person with the disability. So this is a collective and social way of thinking about difference. I think we have a little problem with sound, so I'll pause. Okay. So, Linton says that in traditional uh, courses and interventions about disability, we tend to try to change the person with a disability, to remedy their body, to shift the way that their mind works, to change their behavior. I'm trying to find a spot to stand where there's not an echo. Okay. Um, try right here. And very often, disabled people are acted on, shaped, or tried to be changed in order to fit into the social structure. But instead, disability studies focuses on how do we stop talking about illness, deficit, or pathology, and start thinking about the kinds of representations and situations and social infrastructures that make society not very comfortable to be in as a person with a disability. So this is the work of disability studies, according to Linton. Another way that we often think about this is what disability studies calls the social model of disability versus the medical or individual model. So if we go back to that hand and fist, if we want to change society to make it more accommodating, we tend to think of that as being a social model of disability, a model in which society doesn't fit or doesn't accommodate people as opposed to a medical or individualized model which seeks to cure or change a given person. If you think back to Anne McGuire's talk last week, we can imagine certain kinds of technologies that aim to change the behaviors, ways of thinking, and ways of being in the world of autistic people versus those accommodations that try to make society and interactions easier and more accommodating for those people. So we could also think of this as a curative perspective in the sense um, that disability studies is critical of the idea that disability is something to be cured, fixed, or done away with. And you can also think of it in terms of the charity perspective. We've all seen fundraising efforts to raise money for people with disabilities, and certainly no one's against helping people with disabilities. But the issue here is that very often charities are not led by people with disabilities. So we lose that nothing about us without us model. So if we're going to do a charity to help people with disabilities, disability studies, drawing on that disability activist legacy, says make sure that your charity is working with a nothing about us without us perspective. Yoon Jung Kim, who's a sociologist who works on disability in um, Korea writes that disability is often understood as a kind of vulnerability. And historically, vulnerable bodies are those that are understood to be at a greater risk to unforeseen possible future circumstances. And so in this way, vulnerability is a, what she calls, quote, a prediction of imagined harm. And so one of the sort of historical ways that Western culture has received these wisdoms of charity or need is that we understand disability in terms of presenting a possible future harm to someone who might be seen as vulnerable. And so disability 
observes challenges and disability studies observes challenges and interrogates uh, those sets of assumptions. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, if you're critiquing all of these sort of received wisdoms, what's really left? What is the category of disability according to disability studies? So I wanna say that disability as a category is real. It does things in the world. And this is so even as some people may refuse to identify themselves with this category, and even though the ways in which the category of disability appears in the world may differ from one context or field site to another, or even between two people sitting in the same room who may or may not identify with the word disability or identify the same lived condition of loss of eyesight or loss of hearing or physical impairment as being a disability. And this is the crux of my research as an anthropologist of disability, asking what does the category of disability do? What does disability do in a particular situation? What are people doing with the idea of disability? So disability, after all, is a category of the modern nation state. It came into being when nation states decided that they needed to sponsor and support those quote unquote vulnerable populations through welfare systems. And so when we use the word disability today, that's a word that's directly derived from this historical formulation that a nation state should help the weakest um, and most vulnerable members of the population. You can think back to the sort of 1930s ideas about social welfare. So in this way, disability is actually a category, disability as a category is actually a technology of government and a way that governments use technologies of infrastructure and technologies of care to uh, support and um, control populations of people. So when we think of something as a disability, we have to think about the ways that it exists as a category, not only belonging to an individual body, but to social life and to the ways that societies as a whole build and exercise um, social norms amongst them. On an interpersonal level, Tanya Chichkovsky downtown at OISE, a professor there, says that to conceive of something as a disability can be understood as an oriented act of perception, immediately tied to evaluation that guides interaction. You see someone and you perceive their body and their particular capacity. This orientation grounds critical thinking. The disability should be regarded as that which exists between people one cannot be disabled alone because disability is fundamentally a comparative category that compares one body to a population of bodies. So how then does disability emerge as meaningful in a given reaction, interaction? What power relations are enacted through the invocation of disability as a category and the negotiation of what that category might mean? These are the kinds of questions that I seek to answer through my research. And also, I ask, what does disability studies do in a global context? And I have a slide up here that has one of these kind of stock photo images of globalization with buzzy lights going all around the globe. And I put it there a little bit tongue in cheek because I'm not necessarily advocating for a more inter interconnected globe. But on the most basic level, global disability studies comprises the study of local lived experiences of people with disabilities in diverse global locations and tries to understand how these kinds of global systems might impact the lives of people with disabilities. But recalling that disability studies understands disability in relation to social systems that are disabling and seeks to center the experiences of disabled people themselves, this field must then situate the experience of people with disabilities around the world by analyzing how people with disabilities mobilize power in the context of their specific and diverse cultural configurations of ableism or anti-disability uh, social systems. In this way, 
A global approach to disability studies is challenging because the goal is to map not only one system of ableism, but many systems of ableism, ableisms. And to think about ableism in relation to colonialism, global capitalism, and so on. But moreover, let's take that a step further. Thinking about disability global, globally suggests that the very category of disability cannot be held stable. So let me give you an example from feminist anthropology. In the 1970s, feminist anthropologists were looking all around the world and they were dealing with this one problem, which was a question of why are women seemingly oppressed or dominated by men in so many societies around the world? And they started looking for different examples from different societies and going out and doing ethnography in these different locations. And they were looking in particular at the idea of relations between men and women. But upon cross-cultural consideration in the early 1980s, they realized that the very category of gender itself doesn't hold stable across different cultural settings. So the idea of what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a man and the way that social relationships are enacted might look from the outside like men dominating women to someone sitting in North America reading about it. But in fact, the idea of what it means to be a woman in somewhere like Papua New Guinea or even in Russia uh, might not be the same as what it means to be a woman. And they decided that in fact, gender, the idea of a woman versus a man in social relations, is not something that holds static, but something that's enacted, that somebody is actually doing in their daily lives. The idea of gender itself plays out in social relations. So we have to think about disability cross-culturally as a similar kind of category, something that is constantly made and remade or enacted based on received ideas, and then in turn, those received ideas are changed through social enactments. If you're out there, I'm thinking of Bourdieu, uh, my social theory people. So studying disability cross-culturally means that studying how the category of disability changes, not only between cultures, but in a given interaction from moment to moment, as people claim particular ideas. And it's this perspective in relation to an anthropological approach that grounds the research that I'm sharing with you today. So let's get into that. I'm going to talk now a little bit about research methods and how I came to this topic. So I'll start from, I guess, what I would call the beginning, although for many of you in the audience today, this is sort of the middle. Um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, Soviet Russia was changing very quickly. And it was becoming a place where the idea of a communist future was compromised and changing. And just as the Soviet Union was collapsing, I was a little kid. And I was a little kid who was watching the news or listening to the radio in the backseat of the car and watching documentaries on public television. And I was very interested in this thing about the Soviet Union that was going on. What was it? Why was it ending? Why was it such a big deal? And some genius adult explained to me that they have communism there. And I said, what's communism? And they said, well, it's when everybody has the same amount of everything and nobody has more or less. And as a young kid, I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. And then someone said, yes, but it didn't work. So uh, the Soviet Union is ending. And I said, well, what are you talking about? I'm a kid. I want the same size slice of watermelon as my sister. So uh, what is it about everybody having the same amount of everything? That sounds really fair. That isn't going to work, or that didn't work when people tried it on a uh, national or global scale. So thus began my many year long love affair with the question of why the Soviet Union failed and what the aftermath of living in the Soviet Union is like for people living in post-socialism. On the screen now is this photo of the uh, opening day of the first McDonald's in the Soviet Union. Uh, and there are lines out the door. And there's really interesting um, footage and memories and documentation of the ways that the employees who worked in McDonald's were asked to be specially trained to learn how to smile at customers because the Soviet manner of uh, public service was that you gave as little energy to a social interaction with a consumer as possible because it, after all you weren't trying to make money for your business, you were just trying to get through the day. So um, 
I deeply adore this photo because we tend to think of Russia from North America in terms of long lines, in terms of drab colors, in terms of some kind of deprivation. But as someone who spent years of my life studying Russia from afar and going and studying in Russia as a student, I actually find Russia to be a place that's full of all the highs and lows of emotional life, of bright moments, of sad days, of exciting interactions. And so I see part of my mission as a scholar to bring back this sort of more full understanding of what Russia actually is like today. Here's a photo of me as a graduate student uh, doing field work in Russia. And of course, I had to take the obligatory photo with a statue of uh, Vladimir Lenin in the town square. Um, but I studied in Russia as a high school student, and then again as a university student. And then I worked for several years as an arts and culture manager, linking up artists in Russia with um, um, arts organizations in the United States. Um, and through my studies, I came to be engrossed and excited by the idea of ethnography, the qualitative research method at the heart of sociocultural anthropology. And ethnography historically has this idea of going out and finding um, the insider's point of view from a given cultural setting. And you'll hear me refer throughout the talk today to people as interlocutors or research participants. And those are the people with whom I conducted qualitative interviews, spent a lot of time hanging out and getting to know the way that they live their lives, and doing what anthropologists call participant observation, which was participating in the daily life of a particular group of people. In this case, a group of adults with mobility and speech impairments in one Russian city. So in terms of that city, uh, here's a map of Russia itself. And there are several points on the map showing places where I have visited or done research or studied as a student, uh, as well as one point in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia, where I also conducted a project. Um, and most of the research I'm going to talk about today is from the city of Petrozavodsk, which is in the far northwest of Russia. Um, near Finland. It's about six hours north driving from St. Petersburg, and it's on a big, beautiful lake. Um, and on the next slide, I've kind of zoomed in so you can see that Petrozavodsk is the capital city of the region of Karelia, which borders Finland. I like to think of it as the Pacific Northwest. It's kind of the Vancouver uh, of Canada, or if, if we're in the US, the kind of Seattle or Oregon, uh, Portland. Uh, there are a lot of hipsters, people really like punk music, and there's a sort of cool bike scene for anybody who loves the hipsters of Portland out there. All right, so also I'll just briefly say, speaking of the kind of diversity, we also tend to think of Russia as being a snowy, wintry place. And certainly it is snowy and wintry and northern, as all of us in uh, Toronto understand. but. It's also a summery, warm, beautiful, lush uh, place where the natural landscape is quite uh, green in the summertime. So here's a photo of some of my research participants. I conducted participant observation with a group of adults with disabilities who are participating in an art therapy group. And one of the great things about that art therapy group was that there was free transportation to and from the group. And when you're living on a disability pension or stipend, it's pretty hard to afford a cab. And the public buses in the city aren't accessible. So everybody really loved that they got a free ride in an accessible van to and from this activity. So I use the photo as a van because it sort of is emblematic of how the social situation was unfolding. So coming around to this idea of disability expertise that I want to develop here a bit today, let me give you a first example. On the screen now is an image of a wheelchair ramp. Uh, but where it is situated, it's right next to a front stoop of another business next door, so that that set of steps and stoop actually blocks entrance to the ramp itself. Uh, so uh, this is what I call in some of my research as a quote unquote bad ramp. It's a ramp that any person looking at it can tell 
probably doesn't function for its ostensibly intended purpose of providing access to a space for someone who's a wheelchair user or pushing a stroller or the other kinds of groups of people who might want to use a ramp. So I argue in my research on this topic that in fact the very idea of a good ramp is not a given. It's a global design phenomenon that's been exported from a particular cultural location where people have wheelchairs and the idea of public infrastructure is funded is something that uh, is taken for granted. But when you travel to other places in the world, like Russia, the idea of public infrastructure that makes getting around easy for people is not a taken for granted idea. It's not a given. So arguing that a wheelchair user should be able to get around public space easily is not as obvious as a conclusion as it might be in North America. And certainly those of you who use mobility devices out there know that there are lots of gaps in our accessible infrastructure here in Toronto. It is. Thank you. It's far too steep, and it's also made of very slippery tile. Um, so there are all kinds of reasons why this is a bad ramp. But I also want to argue that the idea of a good ramp becomes a symbol of a particular kind of government or consumer, consumer service that's linked to liberal democracy and the commerce of consumer capitalism that welcomes the customer citizen. If you think back to the McDonald's slide, we expect McDonald's to have an accessible washroom. In this way, ramps that quote unquote don't work for people with disabilities, like the one in the slide, might still quote unquote work for the business that installs them because the ramp becomes a kind of icon or symbol of this style of Western community uh, building and customer service. Now, in contrast to this ramp, which was obviously built with the idea of disabled people in mind, but without consulting a person with a disability. Here's an image of a ramp from a documentary film by a collaborator of mine in which Vera, who has cherry red hair, is sitting in her wheelchair in front of a ramp that runs up to the first floor apartment of her apartment building. And her son is on the ramp on foot, and her husband is sitting nearby in a chair. So, Thinking about this translational space between global anthropology and disability studies has led me to consider how people with disabilities perform expertise in daily life. Disability expertise, in my definition, is enacted knowledge specific to disabled people acquired through life experience lived in non-normative body minds. The concept emerges from ongoing conversations in critical disability studies and feminist science and technology studies. In a manifesto in the journal Catalyst, critical disability studies scholars Amy Hamrai and Kelly Fritch write that disabled people are experts and designers of everyday life. Along with others, they argue that disabled people as users of design technology are systematically or have been systematically discounted as non-experts whose knowledge is not worthy of compensation or recognition, while designers of infrastructure built environments like ramps and sidewalks or assistive technology like wheelchairs or ASL to speech software are frequently depicted as bearers of professional expertise. So, the idea of disability expertise then directly takes on this status quo. Furthering this charge, Sarah Hendren calls for an attention to the virtuosity of disabled users in negotiating their worlds. Hendren says, why does someone riding a snowboard or a skateboard on a ramp get thought of as an athlete who has incredible virtuosity in navigating their mobility device while someone navigating a ramp on a wheelchair isn't seen to hold that kind of virtuosity. Why do we see a ramp in a wheelchair in the case of disability as limiting? In fact, these scholars argue people with disabilities are already engineering and designing their daily lives, engaging everyday expertise to navigate their environments, minimize pain, and facilitate capacity. Thus, the notion of disability expertise builds on scholarship theorizing disability and design, and I offer this concept as one that I have found very useful to think with, even cross-culturally. So in terms of the ramps like the one pictured here, 
It reminds us that disability access must start from the expertise of people with disabilities themselves. This was a ramp that Vera had to have built to get in and out of her apartment, and it works for her very well because she designed the specifications. Similarly, another one of my interlocutors pictured here sitting in her power wheelchair wearing a pink shirt and a gold necklace with a Russian Orthodox cross on it, Anya, she says, why do I need a ramp at the town hall if I can't even get out of my house? And this was something she said to me when I asked her about where ramps were being built in the city of Petrozavodsk. And the, the federal government of Russia, recognizing that disability rights was an important international phenomenon, had signed on to a UN treaty, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, and made funding available for cities to renovate major public spaces to make them accessible to people with mobility impairments. So this meant that around the time that I was doing field work in Petrozavodsk in 2012 and 2013, there were finally coming to be ramps installed in the town hall, in some post offices, in some public theaters where the um, theater company performed. But for people like Anya, who live in 1980s era, so in 1950s era Soviet apartment buildings, getting in and out of those buildings themselves was the major barrier. So even if they wanted to go to the town hall, that's great once you get to the town hall. But getting out of your apartment, down over the steps at the stoop, out to the road, and into a transportation vehicle, and to the center of the city where this accessible building architecture might begin, still caused a major barrier. So from the perspective of a disabled person, the entire pathway matters, not just one ramp. So in this sense, I want to point out that good ramps in this sort of absolute sense begin with disability expertise and from asking people with disabilities themselves what they need. So, with that definition in mind, let's expand, uh, and I'm going to tell a few more stories about the same interlocutor, Anya. On the slide now is, this, is an image of a Russian tea service with some rolls and little open-faced sandwiches. And in Russian households in the region of Karelia, it's customary to offer a guest visiting your home, whether they're a stranger, relative, or close friend, tea. But the phrase to drink tea Pich chai is a euphemism for just visiting with a guest. It's kind of like saying, do you want to have a cup of tea or do you want to get coffee? And you're not really saying, let's go purchase a cup of coffee. You're saying, let's chat. And turving, serving tea, therefore, is a kind of quotidian gesture of hospitality. The practice of sitting down, usually in the kitchen of a family apartment, and preparing a hot drink, usually black tea, but sometimes instant coffee or herbal tea, creates this formal basis for a social exchange. And there's often some kind of fruit or dessert or something to eat with the tea. So as I was conducting research with people with mobility impairments in Russia, particularly because of the inaccessible infrastructure and because I'm an ambulatory person, a lot of times I visited people in their homes. And so oftentimes my interviews took place over tea. Um, and I would arrive and I would hand over some little piece of chocolate or a few pastries uh, that would go to the table where we were going to drink tea. And then I would take off my boots and put on my slippers because Russians don't like to wear their street shoes in their apartments. And then we would kind of get settled and start drinking tea and eating. And Anya is distinctive among my interlocutors in that she's one of the most professionally accomplished. She has two master's degrees and works as a psychologist. And, um, but her impairment is progressive so that she becomes increasingly weak in terms of her muscular capacity over time. Um, and she, in her early 30s during our interviews, uh, used a battery power wheelchair and needed help with many of the tasks of daily living, like um, getting in and out of bed, rolling over, uh, dressing herself, and using the washroom. But she is, is a very sharp and biting wit in the kind of sense of humor that she tells little jokes without even letting you know that she's told a joke so that you end up laughing at the end of the sentence. So the first time that I had tea with Anya in her parents' apartment, um, her mother was in the house somewhere but had rushed off to do something with a nephew or something like that, and Anya and I were alone in the kitchen. And without missing a beat, Anya began to give me instructions 
it was my first time there, as to when and how to pour the tea, where to find a spoon, which bag of cookies in the sweets bowl to untie and serve, and so on. So of course I didn't know my way around her kitchen, um, but she gave me these specific direct instructions in a neutral and even tone. And this was because Anya had enacted this role of host many times before, and she was instructing me about how to fulfill this role of serving tea for our table. And she did this with grace, virtuosity, and the understated confidence of someone who had done it many times before. So although Anya had broken with the typical ritual by not pouring the tea herself or setting out the cookies, because of her sort of muscular weakness, she couldn't lift the teapot herself, uh, she hosted the tea service by offering these instructions for me to follow. And having never encountered Anya before, I wanted to perform my role of guest appropriately, and I was really glad for the instructions. And I remember being impressed by the expertise with which Anya directed me to support her access needs without apology or expectation of pity. So I want to say that in deploying this practice virtuosity, managing my reaction to Anya's own bodily relation to the kitchen, Anya enacted a kind of disability expertise by anticipating my need to be introduced to her access needs and guiding me through the logistics of a ritualized interaction in which her impairment may have prevented her from fulfilling the culturally expected role, but her way of narrating what to do opened a possibility for us to build what disability justice advocate Mia Mingus calls access intimacy or the comfort that emerges when access needs are known and accounted for in a relationship. As Ingrid Moser and um, Law say, people are disabled in endless different and specific ways, and access is never a foreground conclusion, but an unfolding negotiation and a learned manner of relation. So in this tea service, I was cast in and accepted my role as Anya's apprentice, learning the ritual of having tea with Anya from the expert Anya herself. So we can think about this in terms of social science as a kind of situated knowledge um, developed in the feminist science studies tradition. The idea that people are uh, always tinkerers and bricolores and coming up with ways that are creative ways to do things in relation to their specific designed world. And lots of other anthropologists and ethnographers have also described what I would identify then as disability expertise. And on the slide now uh, is a little chart that I created uh, for my research publication on this topic, where there's maybe on the right-hand side a whole realm of disability experience. And then one category of that experience might be what we could define as disability expertise. And then I argue one of the tasks of ethnography and anthropology would be to identify many different kinds of expertise that people with disabilities might enact in their day-to-day -to -day relations. So the one I want to talk about today is at the top of this chart, and it's what I call managing the normate's perception or managing pity. Um, so I'll just tell you one more anecdote, and then we'll conclude. So uh, disability studies scholar Rosemary Garland Thompson, author of the book Extraordinary Bodies, and she's on the screen now, um, says, when one person has a visible disability, and Garland Thompson herself has very unusual hands, um, it almost always dominates and skews the normates process of sorting out perceptions and forming a reaction. The interaction is, usu is usually strained because the non-disabled person may feel fear, pity, fascination, repulsion, or merely surprise. Disabled people must learn to manage relationships from the beginning. In other words, disabled people must use charm, intimidation, ardor, deference, humor, or entertainment to relieve non-disabled people of their discomfort. So this is not unlike Anya's practice expertise when she was instructing me to make and pour the tea. Garland Thompson observes that many disabled people are well practiced in managing not only over ableism or discrimination, but also the negotiation of expectations when meeting new people. Garland Thompson writes, most physically disabled people are skilled enough in these encounters to repair the fabric of the relation so that it can continue. 
So in this way, then, one aspect of disability expertise entails a series of virtuosities to put the non-disabled person at ease, reassuring others who may be uncertain when encountering a specific difference. People with disabilities become uniquely adept, argues Garland Thompson, in managing the pitying gaze. So this is not to say that disability doesn't ever entail some version of suffering that receiving a pitying gaze might have, but rather this expertise is a kind of relational negotiation that has to be tempered in these minute interactions uh, as a disabled person performs what philosopher Aaron Merning calls minor gestures that recalibrate perceptions. So here's another photo of Anya in her apartment. And during an interview one afternoon, she shared a story with me that really illustrates this move of uh, managing the normand's perception. And she told this story in the style of a kind of humorous quip about the stereotypes of disability in her city. She rattled it off really quickly um, and surged toward a kind of punchline. But I'm going to slow it down now to make sure we all uh, are on the same page. <coughs> so here's a short quote. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of it. So Anya says, so I'm out for a walk near the front door to my apartment building. I didn't actually go anywhere because all my friends were busy. I just went out to get some fresh air. And that usually means that someone helped her out down the front stoop in her wheelchair. I'm sitting there by the entranceway. I had taken a book and I'm reading. And out of the corner of my eye, I'm watching people. Who's coming out of our entrance? Who's coming up to it? And this guy goes past me with a kind of jaunty spring in her step and goes into the entrance of our apartment building. I saw him and I thought, I don't think he lives here. He's probably visiting someone. So I sat there and kept reading. And after about 20 minutes, the guy comes back out, walks past me. He's heading toward the store. And there's a spot where you have to go down some steps to get to the bus stop. But when he gets to the steps, he turns around and he looks back at me. And then I see that he's coming back, walking back toward me. And I'm thinking, what's he coming back for? And then he comes up and he gives me 10 rubles. So I ask him, what's this? And he says, oh, you're not asking for change? And I go on, what, I look so bad that you're giving me handouts? So he starts apologizing and runs away. And she laughed. Not too bad. But why did he only give me 10 rubles? If he would have given me 100, well, that would have been something. I would have thought twice about whether or not to take it. But yuck, it was awful. So. Uh, I'm changing the slide now to a couple photos of streets of Petrozavodsk, the kind of places where Anya might have been sitting. In this transcribed interview excerpt, Anya recalls a story in which a stranger passing through the neighborhood noticed her sitting in a wheelchair <coughs> outdoors and assumed that she was in need of charity and approached to offer her a few pennies. Oh, sorry. He approached to offer her a few pennies. But in Anya's telling, the power dynamic of the exchange shifted when she quipped that she didn't need handouts, and the stranger retreated, embarrassed. In this retelling, Anya narrates her own volitional capacity to shift the course of the exchange. Rather than accept that the stranger had assigned her to the category of pitiable panhandler, in Anya's retelling, her response forced the stranger to reconsider the stereotype that motivated his actions. So although she describes the experience as being awful, Anya positions herself in her telling as the bearer of a kind of agentive refusal. She refuses the idea that her embodiment in wheelchair alone make her socially undesirable and characterizes the stranger's assumption that she was in need of handouts as a judgment. In her narrative, Anya manages the specter of the stranger's pity response by casting it as inexpert and uninformed. Meanwhile, she has the social expertise to navigate the situation, which she has presumably encountered in prior variations um, herself. So this idea of refusing pity is central to a disability justice and a disability um, rights modality of activism. And it's one that I find in my interlocutors in Russia as well. Um, but it's also deeply embedded in Soviet and post-Soviet logics of social worth and value. It's not quite the same as the North American manner. Um, so while this refusal of pity might sound familiar to Western disability activists, it's rooted in a sort of Soviet-era uh, rejection of the feeble-bodied and feeble-minded as unable to build communism. And during the Soviet and post-Soviet eras, um, this idea that 
a beggar as someone who is needed by nobody and not an appropriate part of society was quite rife. And other disability studies scholars of Russia, for instance, Yelena Yarskaya Smirnova, have also documented the way that their interlocutors have negotiated pity or handouts, or the perception that anybody with a disability must be poor from public passers-by. But I want to take one more quick look at this quote from Anya. She says, he's coming back, walking up toward me, and I'm thinking, What's he coming back for? And then he comes up and gives me 10 rubles. So I ask him, what's this? And then he says, oh, you're not asking for change? And in this, you're not asking for change. The way Anya tells it, he uses vui, which is the formal version of the word you. So if there are any French speakers out there, you know there's a formal and an informal way of addressing in the second person. So you can say you in a formal, respectful way, or you in an informal, or manner of addressing it, someone junior to you. So Anya, in Russian, says that when she was approached by this man, he used the vui form to speak to her when he registered that she was offended by what he had done, offering her the handout. And then she uses the T form to address him as a younger, a younger person in public. So in this subtle use of Russian vui and tea, she's actually invoked this kind of way of using language as a way to show that she considers herself socially to be uh, someone he should respect and someone that he should be looking up to. And she does not see him as a social superior. So I can get into the details of Russian tea and vui and the many ways that we kind of invoke different uses of language to gesture to hierarchies in society and public. But I want to say that this, by zooming in on this moment, we're looking at one of these minute examples of how someone might navigate um, this sense of uh, social attitudes about disability. And, reinvigorate her sense with a sense of self-respect in spite of the presumed need for charity for a person with a disability. So in conclusion, to sum up, disability expertise is the particular knowledge that disabled people develop about unorthodox configurations of agency, cultural norms, and relationships between selves, body minds, and the designed world. It's an acquired virtuosity in negotiating the meaning that emerges when disability appears in social relations. It's a descriptive domain that ethnographers might use to understand and interpret how disabled people enact their personhood and moral agency in diverse cultural settings. So a few qualifiers, of course. I'm seeking to draw out these particular possibilities, but I don't want us to think about disability expertise or attention to it as a way of only focusing on those interlocutors who appear to be successful subjects in society and detract from the important work of witnessing those who are working to deal with ongoing domination and abuse as people with disabilities. <coughs> And disability expertise is not necessarily resistance in the sense of activist agitation against power with a capital P, but rather the marginal relational enactment of configurations of diffuse or small p power relations um, that are always coming into being in these tiny negotiated moments of um, interaction. So this kind of creative relational improvisation matters as we seek to theorize what disability does and how it appears in day-to-day -day life uh, and how people with disabilities seek to represent themselves as moral people in society. My disabled interlocutor's expertise in managing this vector of pity is just one valence of disability expertise that we might look at. So, Here's a nice little sign that says, it's kind of a um, tongue-in-cheek sign that disability activists in Russia have put up. It's a, uh, mocking the fact that people tend to use uh, accessible parking spaces when they don't have an accessibility marker, something I'm sure you're all familiar with. And it says, do you really want to be in our place? We pravda hatite buit v nasham mieste. So it's mocking the idea that people with disabilities uh, and disability itself is undesirable by pointing out that, in fact, disability parking spaces are very desirable. So uh, in 1998, again, reflecting on the formation of disability studies as a field, Cindy Linton observed 
that disability studies scholars and activists created an intellectual space for a knowledge base that explains the social and political nature of the ascribed category of disability. <coughs> Excuse me. And over the past three decades, this field has continued to evolve, um, taking the point of view of people with disabilities to examine the category of disability and what it does in the social world. So I just want to point out the immense possibility that we have now for disability studies at UTSC. Um, here are a couple of photos from last year of me at a conference uh, with some disability anthropology graduate students and uh, some senior scholars and Judith Human, who is a disability rights activist in the United States and then a flyer for a reading group that we had. So there's lots of activity right now here at UTSC, not only this lecture series, uh, but an emerging course cluster around disability studies for undergraduates and the possibility of starting a research center for disability uh, studies and global disability studies, including courses that I'll be teaching next term. So it's really been my great pleasure uh, to get to be here and be part of this lecture series to close off the month and I'm thankful to all of you for being here and participating in this work of imagining an exciting future for disability studies as a discipline for global research and undergraduate education here at UTSC. So with that, I'm really happy to hear your questions. I'll put up a slide with some further readings uh, from my research if you're curious um, to look them up. And I'm very curious to hear what you all have to say about this. For questions and uh, thank you so much. Thank I'm you. Sure. Okay. Uh, first question. Yes. I'm just gonna get some more water. There is a creature called the Ontarians with Disabilities Act, which is supposed to make the province totally accessible by 2025. Um, the act is as useful as mammaries on a male bovine. Um, <laughs> If you go even around the main campus of the University, the St. George campus, sorry, of the, the University of Toronto, there are a lot of places that are not accessible. Um, I have rheumatoid and osteoarthritis, and I've broken the replacement hip I got, <laughs> which put me into a wheelchair for six weeks, which put me very much into the mind of how a person gets around. I was fortunate enough to be in the... Um, uh, Bridgepoint Rehab, which is like a country club with physio. And as I go around the city, and I, I live downtown, I, I live in the, the Manulife Center, which is very accessible, thank goodness. So when I got home, I could make it to the grocery store, the drug store, the liquor store, everything I needed by taking an elevator or two. However, if you want to go out to dinner downtown, on Bloor or on Young or any place, if you phone up and say, uh, yes, we're accessible, where's your washroom? In the basement. So if you want to stay out for dinner in a place for more than a couple of hours, I don't know if you just wear a diaper or what, <laughs> because it, it's not working. And one of my favorite places to have dinner is the keg on Jarvis, the Keg Mansion. The washroom's on the second floor. And every time I complain, ask, whine, whatever, they say, but we're only leasing this place and we're not allowed to change it internally. And my answer has been lately, put in a porta potty. <laughs> but could you comment on how things are not improving even though the government wants us to? Yes, thank you for that comment. What a wonderful um, illustration and also the kind of deep ironic humor that one has to develop to kind of cope with that situation. And um, I can say that having spent a lot of time with wheelchair users, um, both as, um, as a young person working in uh, disability services and then as an ethnographer spending time with wheelchair users, everything you're describing is very familiar. Um, everywhere in North America that I've lived. I've lived in Massachusetts and North Carolina and in California and New York City um, and now in Ontario. 
And in every one of those places, exactly what you're describing is the case. The laws are in place, um, but the actual built infrastructure is very slow to catch up with the laws. And business owners are very reluctant, unless they're building an entirely new building, to actually do the renovations to get something up to code. Um, so this is also the case in Russia, right, that you have a situation where the law on paper is beautiful. It guarantees full access for everyone. Uh, but how do you actually go about getting the built environment to match up with the law? And it takes a really long time. And what I've seen from disability advocates and some of the people, like Simi Linton on the screen has been advocating for accessible taxis uh, in the New York public taxi fleet, um, is that it really takes this kind of in-your-face street-level activism to actually uh, get the recognition that you need for uh, newspaper coverage of inaccessibility and the kind of um, public outrage that might sway a jury one way or another in a civil lawsuit. Um, and that means that there have to be dedicated disability rights activists who are devoting huge portions of their time and energy to addressing these issues. And certainly the architecture that we've inherited here in Ontario with these little narrow townhouses and the street level um, restaurants doesn't give us very much to work with, but I'm sure you've found um, that there are a few places that have accessible washrooms. And if you have a list, I'd love to see it, because every time a disability studies colleague comes to town as a wheelchair user, we're calling all over the city or doing site visits to see <laughs> where we can go. Sometimes the only accessible washroom is the, the staff washroom. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, or they're, or they're, they're storing the mop and the broom and the uh, grocery bags and their backpacks and their winter coats in there as well, right? Um, having worked in restaurants, uh, the staff bathroom was never clean either, but not because of the people who worked there, but just because uh, nobody had time to clean it. Um, but yeah, I think this is a really great point, and certainly... We are looking for a more accessible TTC. We're looking for more accessible restrooms. And um, I think it's something that everywhere is facing right now. It's not just Toronto. And I'd say you know, this is one of those situations where we can look for the disability-led advocacy organizations that are working on the problem and, and really try to um, support them in the ways that they request. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. I hope your hip is OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for a wonderful talk, Professor Hartley. Um, really enlightening, as always. Just to respond actually directly to your question and to your request for more info, I'll recommend to the group accessto.ca, which is um, an online resource that is, uh, if not crowdsourced, then um, contributed to by a whole range of, of local Toronto um, activists and uh, disability literate folks. Um, and one of the categories is finding accessible spaces, including restaurants, bars and pubs, cafes, music venues, attractions and art venues. Uh, and you can even break it down by location in the city. Now, given the turnover in restaurants and, and so on, that can uh, sometimes be out of date, but it might be a resource that, uh, again, just gives you a quick and dirty, uh, is this place accessible or not? So that might help with uh, um, some of your evening plannings when the, the liquor store has worn off its, uh, <laughs> its appeal for one evening. So accessto.ca. Other questions? This is not actually a question, but I, I just wanted to share an experience that I had uh, many years ago when you're in, uh, um, along the idea of uh, disability expertise. And uh, it, it's, it made such an impression on me that all these years later, I feel like I, I'd like to share it. Um, I was uh, uh, in a community theater production of Wait Until Dark. And so I was playing the blind lady in that production. 
And at the time, I, I didn't know anyone who was blind, and I didn't know really how to go about trying to portray blindness. So I called the CNIB, and I said that what I was doing. I, I actually, at the time, I wasn't sure if they would want to help me or if they'd be willing to help me, but I, I thought at the very least maybe I could borrow a, a white cane from them, because that was something that I, it was a piece that I wanted to have that would be authentic. And uh, the, the receptionist said, oh, I'm going to make an appoint, appointment for you with Betty. And she's uh, one of the people that we get who works with uh, people who have recently uh, become blind and they need to learn all of the stuff. And so she set up an appointment with me with this woman. And boy, was she ever knowledgeable and was she ever an expert. And I mean, she, even the questions she asked me about the character um, you know, was she someone that had been blind from birth or had she recently become blind? All of those things made a difference to how my, uh, how I might handle that, uh, uh, the, the portrayal and what my environment needed to be like. You know, things like uh, how do we set up the apartment so that the person can get around? How do we use the stove? What, what kinds of things do you, you know? She went into all of that. I didn't even think of all this stuff, right? But she went into all of it with me. I went back and saw her twice. Um, and she also did lend me a white cane. <laughs> and uh, um, at, at the end of it all, I felt just, uh, I, like I felt like I had entered the world of the blind. And in fact, I, I ended up rehearsing some of, the, some, some of the time with my eyes closed just to try and, and really you know, feel what it was like to be blind. And at the end of it all, I felt like I had somehow entered that world and felt that there was an experience there um, uh, that made me identify with people who were blind in a way that was uh, not pitying and not uh, looking down, but, but in fact with incredible respect. Wow, what an amazing experience to um, do that and to get to learn from someone. It sounds a lot like the kind of ethnographic process, just sort of interview a firsthand um, expert. And so after doing that, uh, what's your assessment of Audrey Hepburn's performance in the movie <laughs> version? <laughs> well, I love the movie. <laughs> yeah. It's a great one. It sounds like a fun role to play. Um, and what a great service that that uh, advocate provided for you. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I, you know, and it's, it's actually been wonderful. Um, part of my research has been involved with actually creating a play based on the interviews that my interlocutors have um, recorded with me. And in staging that play, I found a really interesting set of ways that actors like you're describing have come to, as someone who doesn't share that disability, come to try to learn about and empathize with experiences. And as I sort of prepare to send the script out into the world, I'm very nervous to make sure that uh, people who might stage the play do exactly what you're describing and, and contact and uh, respect the local disability advocates who can actually share their expertise about what a character with that particular disability might be um, experiencing or what kinds of knowledge they might have about how to navigate the world. Um, there's also a really wonderful um, group of blind theater practitioners here in Toronto uh, who have increasingly been playing roles for blind characters uh, as blind people themselves. So, Alex Balmer is a really well-known um, theater practitioner who's also been working in, um, just did a play that was up uh, this past few months called The Election, where uh, she was actually the accessibility advocate and integrated some access principles into the play itself. Um, we have some great uh, grad students at U of T who are researching disability theater or people with disabilities in the theater. And um, there's actually a performance tonight, if anyone is interested, at Buddies and Bad Times Theater in the cabaret space that is by two blind performers who are going to just share a new experimental piece. So if anybody wants to attend that, it's at 6.30 this evening. Um, yeah, any other questions? I use a cane everywhere I go, except around my own apartment. And I use the subway and buses and streetcars a lot to get around Toronto. And people are amazing. They see the cane, they see the age, and they give me a seat. And it's a good thing they do, because I might fall on them if they don't. <laughs> but people are polite, and they are caring in most cases. Mm, that's wonderful. And 
And I do want to point out that um, while my work is mostly with mobility and, and speech impairments amongst younger adults, um, our uh, Interdisciplinary Center for Health and Society has several experts uh, in aging and disability in uh, the room, including Andrea Cruz, who's sitting back there, one of our professors. So look up her work on um, aging as well, uh, as well as her past Great Explorations talk that's online, I believe. Um, so, and her forthcoming book. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that comment. That's wonderful. And I find the same thing in my disability studies courses here, that young people are um, very quick to want to do well to others um, and very concerned with um, meeting disability with grace, uh, even if they maybe don't have as much practice as they would like, because we still live in a quite segregated society, right, where people with particular kinds of disabilities aren't here with us day to day or integrated into daily life, um, or even segregation across age groups, right, um, in the way spaces we occupy from day to day. Um, so yeah, thank you. Try and be brief. Last Friday night, I was um, heading downtown, and this made me late for where I was going, but didn't matter. Um, so at Kennedy Station, there had been a confrontation that I didn't see at the lower level where the ticket collector is, and so a guy who's white is behind glass, and there's somebody else in there with him. So he's now got numbers on his side. Somebody on the wrong side of the glass was disabled and having difficulty and they were trying to tell her about how to navigate the RT and how to get where she needed to when there aren't elevators everywhere. And she was getting pretty ticked off about it all. So a black woman younger than me intervened because she could see the distress of the lady and understand her problem and she felt the people on the other side of the glass didn't get it and wanted to just dismiss her quickly and whatever. So now we're getting all the isms all muddled up together. You've got gender, you've got color, you've got age, you've got abled and disabled and whatever. When I came on it, the one who had come to the aid of the disabled person who had now moved on, gone, was in trouble because it was escalating and she felt she hadn't been understood at all. And I thought she's going to get in big trouble because security were now there and the next thing would be the police and she'd end up charged in, in court for trying to come to the aid of an absolute stranger. And I thought, what have we descended to? And then the two guys, security and a couple of other drivers that I think were on break or something came to help her out. And they thought because they were black men they could intervene and help her because she was a black woman. And she's like, throw this out, color has nothing to do with it. It was the everything else. And they thought, and of course then you've got age because they were older black men and she was a younger black woman. And now this white woman who's old and white haired is getting into the mix. And she and I ended up, I knew that she just needed a hug. We needed something to, you know, and the two of us ended up laughing mm -hmm. later. I said, they're a bunch of dinosaurs. You're not going to get anywhere with it. Come on out of the mix. You're just going to get in trouble. It's not worth it. Da -da 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 -da. And I looked after her. And the rest of them are there like they still don't get it. And they're just, <laughs> write them off, delete them. They're no, you know, they weren't any help at all. And I thought, what a, what a huge mix. But that's where we're at. Yeah, well, what an experience. I mean, I, it sounds like that story really highlights the way that so often when you're looking for accessible solutions, you're just looking for someone who actually knows. And that kind of expertise isn't always located in the non-disabled people who are wearing the uniform, right? She also recognized um, in the woman, and she said to me, I work with kids. And, oh, right, this is, this is just quote because it's, this gets into being insensitive. But she tried to tell those guys, this lady is not right in the head. You've got to slow down and help her find, go where, she, help meet her where she is. <laughs> it was just the everything that could go wrong went wrong. Oh boy. Yeah, well there you go. Those minute social interactions really show up. Question in the back. I'm wondering about other disciplines that are not uh, studying disability, but how should we think about this as well in our own disciplines? So I'm in organizational behavior, for instance. 
Um, and I recognize that I have a bias when I'm like, it, how I look at the world. Um, how do we incorporate everything that you discussed into other disciplines? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, so one thing I try to tell my students is that one of the tricky things that we tend to get hung up on in the way that the media talks about, as um, one of the other speakers just said, these isms, right, is we tend to think about, um, we start to think about it in terms of individual experiences, either individual experiences of injustice or individual experiences of prejudice. And one of the things that looking at things like ramps that are built into the physical environment shows me is that it's really hard to think about these things as individual actions. It's really hard to build a ramp as one person. Somebody designed the ramp, somebody funded the ramp, somebody hired somebody to construct the actual ramp, uh, somebody actually went to the job site and hired two day laborers to, and told them what to do and then left. And so when you talk about how things like in-access get built into society and built into the system, just like when we talk about how racial injustice gets built into the built environment where housing structures are built or buses run to one neighborhood but not to another, it's important to think about disability in terms of the ableist system that isn't the fault of any one person. So whether or not we have ableist attitudes um, is important, but it doesn't take away the fact that we live in an ableist social system. Uh, so it's very easy to slip into that a thing where we say, well, I'm not X, Y, or Z um, kind of prejudice, uh, but whether or not you are someone who's actively thinking in those ways or perpetuating bias doesn't necessarily mean that you're not part of a system where that bias exists. And by acting in our day-to-day -day lives, um, we are oftentimes um, unknowingly part of that system. So. Uh, all of which is to say, uh, when we're thinking about disability in particular, it can't necessarily be separated from the other kinds of social systems of oppression that we're dealing with. So that when we talk about how disability appears in the lives of our um, fellow citizens or um, fellow dwellers on this land, it might not necessarily be uh, as obvious and shared of an experience from one community to another. Um, I'm sure that in organizational um, work you would encounter different kind of echelons of a particular institution, right? So that having a disability if you work in the mailroom and having a disability if you work in the boardroom uh, allows for different kinds of accommodations and different kinds of assumptions about what kinds of accommodations you might deserve um, in terms of your value that you bring to the company or to the organization as perceived by others. So I would... Um, suggest like looking at ableism with its intersections with racism and sexism and classism uh, as an important way to think about how disability might be functioning in a particular space, not always in the same way, but differently for different locations. I hope that helps. When uh, we go through a doorway, what we normally do is just grab the handle and pull. But if you look around, I think you see that there are a lot of people who push those uh, things on the uh, wall and the door opens automatically. If you're uh, going to take a stairwell and there's a uh, ramp for people with wheelchairs, what uh, most of us do is uh, make a decision as which one we're going to use. And at least 50% of the time, we take the ramp instead. And these uh, things that we put in place for people with disabilities, more often than not, are used by everyone, which basically me makes me think that we're all disabled to some degree. <laughs> and uh, I think the only difference is that some people have a visual disability and some people don't. And I think if you really want to understand what the people with the disabilities are actually living through, just think of some of the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, compare that to somebody with a disability and realize that maybe we all have that disability just to a maybe lesser degree. Sure. Um 
Thank you for that. There's so much um, amazing, so many amazing insights in your comment. Um, I I love I love this um, point that many others have made that accessible design is a design that improves access for a lot of different people. And some other examples might be um, the little sign on the bus or the fact that they announce on the bus which stop is coming next. That's an accommodation for the blind that I certainly find useful even though my own vision is really good with corrected lenses. Um, but don't catch me without my contacts in. Um, but I think your, your point that we all fall on the kind of spectrum of disability and ability and that changes from moment to moment, whether we're tired or stressed or exhausted or energetic um, or over the course of our lives is a really important insight. Um, of course, when we think about these accommodations, it is important to remember, as you said, that uh, even though they might benefit everyone, um, captions on videos or the announcements on the bus, uh, we do have to remember that they really are there uh, as a way of centering the experience of people who are otherwise excluded, right? Um, and we also have a responsibility to look and consider the ways that particular groups of people might still be excluded because of the way their disability intersects with other kinds of systems of oppression in society, right? Um, so uh, thank you very much for that comment. And I also love to press the door button. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Before I ask my question, I have a quick um, thing about accessibility. Uh, washroom in the old, old church the, of the Holy Trinity in the Eaton Center. I mean, that building, you know, is, I don't know how old, 100 anyway. They have decided, because the stairs down to the washrooms are terrible for anybody, whether they're able or not, they've got one accessible washroom. And I went to use it and I couldn't find the, the, the button to press. And somebody said, oh, here it is, and pressed it before I got out of the way. And the door came out and hit me in the face. Because <laughs> most of those doors go the other way. So warning if you ever go to the Holy Trinity <laughs> They uh, To get to your point of um, uh, nothing about us without us, they are, of course, um, a retrofitting all the go stations, and they're doing all these things at, at the various public places. Do they, in, in, uh, do they really involve somebody who's going to be using this in order to make sure that they've got this the way it should work? That's a great question. Um, I actually don't know about how the city of Toronto uh, uh, invites or doesn't invite um, disability advocates to that process. Um, I can tell you a little bit about the fact that uh, architects who are designing these spaces work with a series of checklists. And architects have these checklists for everything, for how many windows are necessary in a building, for um, how high a ceiling should be in relation to a heating system, and all that kind of technical stuff that I don't even really understand. Um, but I know that uh, they also have, in professional international standards, checklists for um, mobility impaired groups of the population, which includes people with strollers or people who walk with canes and things like that, as well as wheelchair users. And that requires things like when you go into the accessible washroom, is there room to get up and stand out of your wheelchair and turn around and reach a railing? Or can you turn your wheelchair around in the space, right? Um, so one of my interlocutors told me about someone who installed a ramp but didn't leave space to turn at the spot where you had to turn. So there's no flat point to turn around. So it looks like a nice ramp if you're walking, but if you're on a wheelchair, there's no kind of flat space to turn and go back up the other direction as it kind of snakes up a hill. So um, one of the things that disability access experts say is that, yeah, not only ask the accessibility experts who are the people themselves, but that in general, checklists are a really good start, right? But access in every situation is a complex relationship between someone's particular technology, their particular body, the particular situation, and the other people around them. So it's really hard to represent in a checklist that thinks of everything. And because checklists get passed on, and they're meant to be something that can be um, consumed and used by anyone, it loses that kind of specificity that the actual relationship of accessibility uh, requires, which is to look at a person and say, what do you need to do this? Um, so I think 
all of you seem like people who are ready and open to that kind of engagement. Um, so the question when it comes to accessibility is how do we carry that ethos into our interactions further? Um, thanks for your question. It's a great one. Thank you. I have a few housekeeping things, but first let's just thank you for a really wonderful talk and Q&A. Thank you. Thank you.